So before digestive enzymes can begin digesting the proteins that we ingest into our body, they have to be activated via the process of proteolytic activation, proteolytic cleavage. Now the problem with proteolytic cleavage is, once that enzyme undergoes proteolytic cleavage, proteolytic cleavage cannot be reversed. So once we break that peptide bond in that uh, zymogen to form the active form of that digestive enzyme, that process cannot be reversed. So that implies that proteolytic cleavage is a one-way street. The question is, once we activate our digestive enzymes, and once our digestive enzymes actually carry out their function, what happens to those digestive enzymes that actually turns off the activity of those enzymes? Because once we break down all the macromolecules that we ingest, we want to be able to actually turn off the activity of all the digestive enzymes. Because if we don't turn off the activity of these digestive enzymes, they will continue breaking down the proteins, and that includes the proteins, found surrounding our cells in the extracellular environment. So the question is because we don't want this to actually take place, we don't want our digestive enzymes to basically damage our own tissue, what we do is our cells use inhibitors, irreversible inhibitors, to basically turn off and inhibit the activity of these functional enzymes. So our body utilizes irreversible inhibition to switch off the functionality and the activity of many different types of digestive enzymes. And the ones we're going to focus on in this lecture is trypsin and elastase. So these inhibitors, basically they bind into the active site of the enzyme and once they bind into the active site, they block the substrate molecule from actually entering the active site and by this manner, because that inhibitor binds irreversibly to the active site of the enzyme, it basically blocks and inhibits the activity of that digestive enzyme. So let's begin by focusing on trypsin and how our body actually regulates and turns off the activity of trypsin. Now, remember, trypsin is a very important digestive enzyme. It's probably the most important one, and that's because what trypsin does is it acts as a master activator, and what that means is it basically activates all the different types of digestive enzymes from their zymogen form into their active form. In fact, trypsin not only activates proelastase into elastase, procarboxypeptidase into carboxypeptidase, chymotrypsinogen into trypsinogen, it also activates, it, uh, it also activates itself. It activates trypsinogen into trypsin, and it also activates prolipase into lipase, our digestive enzyme that is responsible for breaking down the, li the lipids that we ingest into our body. So trypsin is a very important digestive enzyme it's, re it's responsible for essentially coordinating the activation of all the different types of enzymes at the same exact time. And that's precisely why it's very important that our body has a very effective way of switching off the activity of trypsin when it needs to. So there's a special type of inhibitor that our cells produce known as the pancreatic trypsin inhibitor. And this is basically what it looks like. So we have some alpha chains, we have the, well actually we have one alpha chain and we have these two beta chains. Now notice we have this single amino acid lysine 15. And it's lysine 15 that has a negative charge that is responsible for binding to the positively charged amino acid found in the active site of trypsin. Remember, trypsin is a protease. And inside the active site of trypsin, we have a specific type of residue that has a negative charge that plays the role of catalyzing that reaction. And so because the lysine 15 contains a negative charge, it can interact very well with that positively charged amino acid found in that active site of trypsin. So 
What pancreatic trypsin inhibitor does is it acts as an affinity label, a substrate analog, and this is one example of irreversible inhibition. This molecule basically looks very much like the substrate molecule that binds into the active site of trypsin. In fact, the structure of this pancreatic trypsin inhibitor is complementary to the structure found inside the active site and that's exactly why upon binding to the active site this molecule doesn't actually change in a uh, it doesn't actually change in shape because the shape of this molecule is already complementary to the shape of that active site and once it binds onto that active site because of that perfect fit it does not dissociate, it does not let go. And so it blocks the entrance of substrate molecules and in this manner, it basically inhibits the activity of trypsin. So pancreatic trypsin inhibitor is an example of a highly potent irreversible inhibitor of trypsin. It binds very tightly to trypsin's active site and blocks its activity. And as I mentioned earlier, pancreatic trypsin inhibitor is a substrate analog, also known as an affinity label. And it resembles the structure of that substrate molecule. In fact, the inhibitor has a structure that is essentially complementary to that active site of trypsin. Now, inside our body, we actually have a relatively low concentration of pancreatic trypsin inhibitor compared to the concentration of the actual digestive enzyme trypsin. The question is, if we have so much more trypsin inside our body compared to the pancreatic trypsin inhibitor, how is this inhibitor actually able to turn off the activity of digestion, the breakdown of proteins and lipids and other macromolecules? Well, essentially, because trypsin plays such an important role in the activation of all these different enzymes, digestive enzymes, basically inhibiting a small amount of trypsin really goes a long way because of the importance, the role that trypsin plays in the overall activation of our digestion. So pancreatic trypsin inhibitor binds to trypsin in the pancreas and in the ducts. And even though the concentration of trypsin inhibitor is much lower than the concentration of trypsin itself, the inhibition of even a tiny number of these trypsin molecules goes a long way because of trypsin's role as this master activator because it plays such a crucial role in activating the entire digestion process because it activates all the different types of digestion, digestive enzymes that exist inside our digestive system. Now, the next question I'd like to ask is, what exactly happens to our body if the pancreatic trypsin inhibitor is either mutated in some way or we produce an inadequate amount of the pancreatic trypsin inhibitor. Well, if we don't have enough of this inhibitor, what that means is we'll overproduce the trypsin and we'll have too many active trypsin molecules inside our pancreas. And if we have too many active trypsin molecules, what that means is these active trypsin molecules will begin to break down the extracellular proteins found surrounding our cells inside the pancreas. And this will cause the destruction of the tissue found in the pancreas. And this condition is a medical condition. It has a name of acute pancreatitis. So our inability to produce adequate pancreatic trypsin inhibitors can lead to serious tissue damage in the pancreas. And this can lead to inflammation of the pancreas, a medical condition we call acute pancreatitis. Now, remember, trypsin itself, in its zymogen form called uh, protrypsin, is produced in the pancreas. And so as it travels through the pancreatic ducts, if it's activated in those ducts, it will basically begin to digest and break down the extracellular environment found around the cells in the pancreas if we don't have enough of this inhibitor to actually inhibit the activity of that trypsin.
Now let's move on to another type of digestive enzyme and let's see how this enzyme is actually inactivated. So this enzyme we're going to focus on is elastase. Now elastase can be produced essentially in two major regions. Elastase is either produced by the acinar cells found in the pancreas, these are the exocrine cells that we spoke about previously, and this type of elastase is known as pancreatic elastase, and the other source of elastase are white blood cells known as neutrophils, and these are basically those uh, cells that are able to actually engulf bacterial cells that invade our body. So we have pancreatic elastase, and we also have neutrophilic elastase. Now pancreatic elastase is used to break down those um, proteins that we ingest into our body. But neutrophilic elastase can be used by these white blood cells to actually break down and kill off bacterial cells. But sometimes, as we'll see in just a moment, the neutrophilic elastase can, can also actually cause damage to our own extracellular tissue, as we'll see in just a moment. So, we conclude that elastase can be used to break down the proteins we ingest via food molecules and we can also use it to basically destroy bacterial cells and in some case we can use it to basically destroy our own host tissue. Now, just like we have pancreatic trypsin inhibitor that inhibits trypsin, we also have an irreversible inhibitor that basically inhibits the activity of elastase. And this type of inhibitor is known as alpha-1 antitrypsin. Now, the reason it's called antitrypsin is because this also actually inhibits the activity of trypsin. So this inhibitor, alpha-1 antitrypsin, can also bind into the active site of trypsin and inhibit the activity of trypsin. But as it turns out, although it does bind to trypsin and inhibit trypsin's activity, it binds much more effectively and it inhibits much more effectively the activity of elastase. And so alpha-1 antitrypsin binds into the active pocket, the active site of elastase, it binds irreversibly, doesn't dissociate from the active site, and it blocks other substrate molecules from entering the active site, and therefore it inhibits the catalytic activity of elastase. Now, the next question is, what happens if this inhibitor alpha-1 antitrypsin is actually inactivated. So if we mutate the inhibitor in some way or if our body simply isn't able to produce an adequate supply of this inhibitor, what exactly happens? So in the case of inhibiting or destroying the pancreatic trypsin inhibitor, we saw that this can lead to acute pancreatitis. But in the case of destroying or mutating this inhibitor, we essentially will have an excess amount of elastase. Now, what exactly will that lead to? Well, these neutrophils are found predominantly in the boundary region between the outside and the inside environment, and this means the lungs, because remember, the alveoli of the lungs basically create that boundary between the outside environment, the air, and the inside environment. And so these neutrophils are going to be found predominantly in the alveoli of our lungs, and if we somehow inhibit the activity of the alpha-1 antitrypsin, if our body doesn't produce enough alpha-1 antitrypsin, or if, you, if we mutate alpha-1 antitrypsin in some fashion, what that means is these neutrophils will essentially produce too many of these elastase molecules, and if we have too many active elastase molecules inside our alveoli, these elastase will begin to break down the alveoli walls of our lungs. And by breaking down the extracellular tissue inside the alveoli of the lungs, what that does is it basically decreases the elasticity 
of those alveoli. And what that means is we're going to have a much harder time breathing. So we have to breathe harder to basically exchange the same volume of air as in the normal case. And this condition is known as emphysema. So pulmonary emphysema is the process by which we have the breakdown of the tissue found in the lungs and that basically leads to change in the property of those alveoli and that makes it much more difficult to actually breathe. So we see that mutation or inadequate concentration of alpha-1 antitrypsin can lead to tissue damage, particularly the tissue found in the lungs. And that's because those neutrophils are found at the boundary between the outside and the inside, that is the lungs. And so if the neutrophils release too many elastase and those elastase are not deactivated, are not inhibited by this alpha-1 antitrypsin, that can basically lead to destruction of the tissue found in those alveolar walls. And that can lead to pulmonary emphysema or simply emphysema. This is known as destructive lung disease. Now, since we're on the topic of emphysema, let's actually talk about how smoking can lead to this condition known as emphysema and what smoking actually does to this particular inhibitor. So basically, when we're smoking, we're creating a bunch of different types of oxidizing agents. And so when we smoke, when we inhale that smoke, all these different types of oxidizing